All right, we welcome you to Primetime Rundown, the interview series, episode 58, right here on the Eastern Observer. I'm your host, Brandon Natale. We join. We are joined by two-time World Series champion and New York native Gene Larkin. Now, for those who are joining us for the first time, Gene joins a long list of baseball lifers who have appeared on our show, spanning back the Mets beat writer Anthony DiComo, Phillies athletics writer Matt Gelb, and Major Leaguer Scott Hairston, and many others. Gene, thank you for joining us this afternoon. How are you feeling today? Thank you, fellas. I really appreciate it. Looking forward to our discussion. Yes, and uh, before we start, I'd like to say, obviously, thank you again for coming on. My dad has always spoke highly of you, obviously, <laughs> dating you know, dating back to the St. Rayfield's days. Um, Were you a better athlete than your dad, Brandon? That, that's a good question. <laughs> um, <laughs> I would say the same. That's, <laughs> I'd like to say I was a little better, but th- that's, a, that's actually... We both have the same passion about baseball. Yeah, unfortunately, with the wrong team, but I'll take. Pri- I still take pride in. I still take pride in them. You know, I won't ever switch over to the evil empire. You know, it's not me. Obviously, uh, but I, my dad obviously he said, uh, you know, whether it was baseball, or it was hockey, you know, having Gene in your team, it was it was great. Oh, so he, speaking of the devil, Mister Natalie, yeah. how you doing, Sal? Hey. What's up, Gino? Let's go. I love Dude, it. How you doing, buddy? Good. Good morning, Dennis. How's it going, Mister Natalie? <laughs> hey. It's like I just, saying, I just asked Brandon if he was a better athlete than you, Sal. <laughs> no, I, you know, unfortunately, in this house, we didn't raise athletes. <laughs> yeah, I was a good goaltender, if you remember. I know, I know, I know. You <laughs> never like got Steve out of Ray- the way of a puck. <laughs> <laughs> Gene Larkin slap shot. <laughs> yeah, I, I, anyway, I, I really appreciate you coming on with these guys. Sure, um, and, uh, uh, I, I hope when you come to New York, definitely hope we can get together. Seriously, we'll hook up. We'll hook up. Thank you. All right, Gio. Thank you, brother. All right, Paul. All right. All right. That, that's uh, Sal Natale from Seaford, everybody, making a quick appearance. I want to know. I'm still, still, uh, still a great man, though. Yeah, definitely bad. <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you, obviously, again. Thank you, Gino, for coming on now. So I, I know we were discussing earlier, but obviously, like we said, uh, you grew up in New York and. Yeah. You know, obviously, back you know the Yankees and the Mets. Um, who did you root for, and were there any players that you tried to mold your game after? Yeah, big Yankee fan, fellas. Growing up, uh, did not really like or enjoy <laughs> watching the Mets. It, when I grew up in New York, it wasn't about you could root for both teams. You had to pick a side, and I and I picked the Yankees. My parents loved the Yankees, so they kind of brought me up in that family. Uh, discussion every night at the dinner table discussing the, the Yankee exploits, whether it was good or bad. So, and, and my favorite player growing up was Bobby Mercer. You guys probably don't remember oh. him way too young for that, but uh, he was a center fielder, right fielder for the Yankees, left-handed hitter. And in the old Yankee stadium, they had a real short, uh, low outfield fence in right field. He hit a lot of home runs out there. And he, uh, I kind of watched him play every, every game I could. I just uh, admired the way he, Funny thing about that was when I got to play in the big leagues with the Twins and I visited the Yankees, playing the Yankees, he was announcing yep. for the Yankees at the time. So in the pregame, I went up to him and I, I shook his hand and I said I so much admired the way he played and I kind of modeled my – so from a younger player to see a guy that he had – that I admired so much on the field with the team that I had loved watching and rooted for my whole life, that was a big deal to me. Wow. Yeah. And did you, uh, did you ever um... – Obviously, you ever you played at Shea before, right? And you visited I there. Just, no, I never yeah. played at Shea. I just played some all-star games in college, uh, but never played professionally at Shea Stadium. Because back then, they didn't have uh, interleague games at all. Wow. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Uh, did you ever did you ever like going there compared to Yankees, the old Yankee Stadium to Shea? Uh, I mean, there's nothing comparable to the old Yankee Stadium. There's so much history uh, in that park. You know, you talk about how many Hall of Famers had played for the Yankees, how much – uh, how much winning played a part in that organization? Um, I don't even know how many World Series I have they have under their belt right now. But um, Shea Stadium was fine. Um, now City Field, obviously. But when when I was up growing up, it was Shea Stadium. But nothing compared for me being a Yankee fan going to watch the Yankees. Just the smell of the grass as you walked into Old Yankee Stadium was phenomenal to me. Mm. And the roll calls, I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> Now, uh, how how did your passion for baseball first come about? Did you, uh, if you could tell? Yeah, I just I played all the sports. Um, you know, in fact, if I was uh, if you had asked my high school teammates what sport they thought I'd get better at or play professionally, they probably would have told you basketball because I was a better basketball player growing up. 
um, than baseball. But my passion was baseball. I just yeah. loved the game. I loved to practice the game. Whereas in basketball, I just played it because I was pretty good at it. Whereas baseball, I really wanted to practice and get to my ultimate potential. And, um, you know, if you had watched me play in high school, you would have never said I had a chance to play professionally. Um, but I just kept working at it. I got bigger and stronger in college and at Columbia University in New York. And I was drafted by the Twins after I graduated in 1984 in the 20th round and um, kept at it, grinded it out in the minor leagues. And I got called up to the big leagues in 1987, which was the first uh, World Series team that Minnesota Twins had won. So I keep telling people I turned that whole program around with my with my rookie year. So it was uh, I was really fortunate to come. Uh, upon Twins at that particular time. It took me about two, two and a half years from getting yeah. drafted out of Columbia to playing in the minor league ball to 1987 getting called up in May uh, just as the season started because of an injury. And uh, fortunately yeah. for me, I, I did enough to show them that I belonged and I played uh, seven straight years with the Twins. Yeah. Congratulations to that. That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, how did you know that you were ready to take that leap from Columbia to going pro? Obviously, you always had a passion for it, but uh, yeah, you never, Dennis. You never really know whether you have that. Uh, you know, you just want an opportunity coming out of college. Like I said, I was drafted late in the twentieth round. I got a hefty twenty five hundred dollars signing bonus um, from the scout that signed me. And growing up in New York and playing in the Eastern division, I didn't follow the twins or anybody really in the Western division. So it's kind of like, you have to do your homework. Um, your first spring training out there, you kind of meet and greet people who, um, you, you've heard about, but have never seen play quite a bit. Um, so I had some really good seasons in the minor leagues. I had, uh, three years or two and a half years of basically hitting 300 um, my two full years in the minor leagues I drove in 100 runs each year so uh, in 1987 um, I was on the 40-man roster for the first time it was my first big league spring training and in, in those days the twins uh, had spring training in Orlando um, got cut the last week of spring training in 87 I went down to AAA and I played a month at AAA hit 300 and again because of an injury they called me up in mid-May of 87 and uh i got a few big pinch hits in the first few weeks of, of my big league career that kind of solidified my role as a rookie um my manager tom kelly put me in some pretty good spots i hmm. i backed up ken herbeck my basically my entire life as a twin um and played a little right field later on in my big league career but i was basically a designated hitter a switch hitter um so i had a I was pretty lucky, very fortunate that I played for the, the Twins at that particular time and obviously had a very big moment in 1991 when I drove in the winning run with a pinch hit single in the 10th inning against the Braves. Yeah, what was the, the draft pro – <clears throat> oh, sorry about that. What was the uh, process like getting – like the draft process like for you? You said you had so gotten drafted I, I, in the I graduated round. from Columbia. You know, I did the old, you know, look for a job. Uh, graduated in May for that following month. I, you know, before the draft, I looked for a job. There was no guarantee that I was going to get drafted. Um, in those days, that had a lot more rounds. I had over 50 rounds in baseball. I believe now they might have 15, um, if that. So it's a little bit easier to get drafted out of college back then in 84. But I had no no expectations what round I was going to go in or who was going to draft me. So, um, you know, when I got the call that I was drafted in the 20th round by the Twins, I was, you know, tremendously excited for an opportunity. Again, not knowing anything, uh, what that means. I was I played third base in college, so they, they saw me as an infielder, but they did not see me as a third base, and they felt that my best – uh, opportunity to grow as a player would be as a first baseman. So they moved me across the diamond to play first base in my first minor league season. I had no idea how to play first base. And everybody assumes that all it is is just catching the ball. Um, but it's a little bit more difficult than that, especially when you never played that position or that side of the diamond before. Balls coming off the bats at different angles, um, understanding how to go after a ball between first and second. When does a second baseman take it? When do I take it? Bunt players are a little bit different. So the nuances of first base, if you've never played it, uh, are probably a little bit more difficult than people assume to be because they just see a guy running to first base and catching the ball coming across the infield. But there's a little bit more nuance to that. So it was about a year before I became more comfortable at first base. But uh, um I got the job done, and I, I got the opportunity I want to uh, have by getting to the big leagues. Yeah, it's uh, well, 
that's amazing. And um, at Columbia, um, you became known for being one of the best hitters in program history as you know, uh, switch hitting third baseman. Now, uh, between your junior and senior years, your batting average jumped nearly fifty points. Um, what what changed in your approach? Because in in your freshman year, you batted three hundred nine. 344 your sophomore year and then 373 in your in your junior year uh because then your senior year you batted almost 429 and you either broke or tied 13 out of possible 16 records so what changed in your Under approach research, to Brandon, i like it i like it nice that's right yeah, my, you know? my biggest difference is i got bigger and stronger um hit the weights quite a bit um also i had just started switch hitting as a freshman in college so it took okay. it took about two years before i got really comfortable as a natural right-handed hitter um, but I became a better left-handed hitter because of all the work I put in toward it. Um, so between my junior and senior year, getting bigger, getting stronger, getting more experience hitting from the left side of the plate, I, I put some really good numbers up um, during that season. And that allowed me to get noticed by the professional teams. Yeah. Um, people had come out. You could tell they, they told the coach, you know, we're going to come out to see this particular guy, this particular game. So I knew they were watching me. Um, it was just trying to be patient enough to uh, have a good year, put good numbers up, and then hopefully and praying that I would get an opportunity that some big league team would give me whatever round they were going to choose me and just give me an opportunity to see if I can play professionally. What made you want to be a switch hitter, make that transition from being a pure right-handed hitter to uh, doing both? To be very honest, Dennis, I was not a very good right-handed hitter. Um, you know, I was not even the best high school hitter at Chaminade in New York. Um, so when I went to Columbia, um, I told the coach the fall season of my freshman year that I'd like to give this a shot. I've always practiced it, but I've never played in a game as a left-handed hitter. And um, fortunately for me, he was very open-minded. He watched me hit in the fall from the left side. He, he said he would be patient with me and gave me an opportunity. And uh, the more experience I've got, uh, the stronger I got, the better hitter I got. So, um, you know, I would tell you that if I could hit curveball righty on righty I probably would not would have tried to switch hit because it's difficult you know you're working twice as hard as a hitter you're practicing your right-handed swings and then you got to make your left-handed adjustment and get as many at bats or swings as you can in practice so yeah. um, but because I was not a good right-handed hitter against right-handed curveballs I felt in order for me to reach my potential I had to give that a shot um, and when I did and the coaches were patient enough with me um, in the beginning, as a freshman year at Columbia, I couldn't really pull the ball very much. So everything was between third and short and left field. Um, but as I mentioned, as I got bigger and stronger, my pull side got good. And then uh, by the time I was a junior to senior, I got some power numbers on the board. And that's what the professional scouts noticed as my senior year started mm -hmm. to evolve. So, okay. Now, uh, obviously, you did play at Columbia University for all, all those years. Uh, what led you to Columbia and were, were there any other offers back? There was very few offers. I was probably going to go to Hofstra if I, I didn't go to Columbia. Um, I got a few offers from a division two level at, for basketball, like I mentioned, yeah. but not a lot of uh, D one offers for, for baseball. Um, Hofstra stepped up. I was going to actually try to go to the Naval Academy. They had some interest in me, um, wow. okay. but I did not really want to go there and spend after I graduate, you'd have to spend four or five more years at Academy after you graduate. And, um, I told my parents that I didn't, I'd love to go to a Naval Academy for an academic situation and baseball, but I didn't want to spend four years after school because I wanted to see if I could try to play professionally. And, uh, and frankly, my parents thought I was crazy. Um, like I mentioned, I wasn't the best hitter in high school. So they were kind of saying, you know, what makes you think that I could ever play professionally, get a great education, guarantee, be a guaranteed job coming out of the Naval Academy. But my, my heart and my mind was set, and I've got to give this a chance. So I wanted to go to a, a non-military school, play baseball, and then hopefully get an opportunity to, uh, to get drafted. Um, and the Columbia coach had seen me play a few games in the summertime, and he, uh, he came up to me and my parents and said, you know, uh, he thinks I could play a good third base at Columbia. They, uh, they were going to put a lot of freshmen – or give a lot of freshmen an opportunity my freshman year, which he did. He was very truthful and honest with me. And uh, I got to play right away as a freshman. My freshman year, I played almost every game. So that was a, a big deal to me to, to play right away and not watch from the bench my freshman year. Mm. Yes, I, I have a question. Perhaps maybe it's a little off topic, but we're talking about your college career. Looking 
to the present day with the NIL deals and this transfer portal. Uh, what do you think about that as a obviously a proficient college athlete in the 1980s? So I, I think I think the NL NIL has the right idea. Um, you know, kids should have the ability to make money off their name, image, and, image and likeness. Yeah. But I do think we're going down this rabbit hole where a lot of um, money is coming in, not necessarily good money. And what I mean by that is like, do we really know how much money these kids are making under the table? Um, you know, that was, that's always been the case where um, people who try to get their kid in there or some booster does something illegally or gives something to free. That's always been the case. But I think now um, when you see players driving a hundred thousand dollar cars around campus, Ooh, yeah. uh, it, it's getting to the point now where it, to me, it's a little bit ridiculous. Um, and unscrupulous people obviously tend to gravitate toward money and get kids involved in things probably they shouldn't get involved in or under the table. So I'm a little bit leery of how this is going to work long term, short term. Everybody loves it. If you're a kid in the college, um, you know, influences on social media now are making good money. And I'm all for that now in this generation. I think it's terrific. But I also think it needs to be regulated a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and I have no confidence that the NCAA is going to be able to regulate this properly because they don't do things right anyway, for the most part. So, um, but so I, I think uh, it's a good idea. Um, whether it turns into something tragic for certain people uh, remains to be seen. And uh, and I'm and I'm hoping that somebody figures it out where um, kids have the ability to go to school, make money, and turn professionally in the proper sequence. If you know what I mean. Sure. And just yeah. one last question about uh, your college career. You went to Columbia University, a very prestigious Ivy League school. How were you able to balance that kind of academic workload alongside your baseball obligations? You just you do the best you can to be organized and prepared. Um, I felt coming out of Chaminade uh, prepared me for my freshman year since it's a high academic high school. I thought it was a big deal for me to understand how to study properly how to organize my time properly. Um, you know, there's enough time in a day if you want to get things done the right way. I mean, if you want to procrastinate and screw around and fall behind, it's going to be tough. But if you have the mindset that you're organized and you keep your time to where it should be, you, you, you set your, you know, your time box for academics, your time box for working out, your pregame type stuff, it can get done. Now, back in the day there wasn't too many professors who really give give a hoot about whether you were a professional or whether you were a college athlete or not they didn't really give you too much uh leeway you had to get your assignments in on time and blah. but back you know i'm an old man fellas you know back then d1 baseball wasn't like it is right now where the kids are traveling all over the country i i stayed on the east coast we're just bus rides. It wasn't like we were taking 10, 12 hour bus rides and then had to do the assignments. It was a two or three hour bus ride, maybe. Um, so it wasn't that difficult to do back in the day. Okay. Right. So um, you made a name for yourself with your iconic hit in the 1991 World Series, as you alluded to earlier. Now, um, I think it's time for us to show the folks at home what you did <laughs> in that game seven, courtesy of MLB Advanced Media and CBS Radio. The Larkin, the left-hand hitter up there, bases loaded, one out, and the game on the line. Pena, right foot on the rubber. You can taste the pressure here in the dome as Alejandro straightens up. And the pitch to Larkin. Swung on, a high fly ball into left center. The run will score, the ball will bounce for a single, and the Minnesota Twins are the champions of the world. Obviously, yes, that is uh, well, courtesy I of... I never get tired yeah. of watching that swing. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't I, either if I was you. Yeah, I, I can imagine what was uh, going on for, you know, through your mind. You kept, you know, making, you know, checking, you know, make, you practicing your swing. You guys, you guys want to know the truth? Go ahead. So when I got the call from the dugout that Tom Kelly wanted me to pinch hit, 
I was so freaking nervous. It was incredible. You can't see it, but from the dugout to the on-deck circle, my legs are shaking because I, I know the the uh, the pressure that's on me just to hit the ball and drive in the winning run and win the game for us and win the world championship. But, but very honestly, from the time I got in the batter's box, I felt mm-hmm. a sense of calm come over me. Um, and, you know, after the fact, I don't think about this during the moment, but after the facts, I, I asked it myself, why did I feel so calm? And I've come to the conclusion that I felt calm in the box because Alejandro Pena, who was the pitcher for the Braves, yes. um, I felt watching him pitch in previous games in the World Series, I felt he was a good matchup for me. Not that he wasn't a good pitcher, but I felt that I was a good contact hitter and that he was not going to be able to strike me out. So in that situation, from a hitting perspective, if you feel like you're going to be able to put the ball in play, it gives you a greater deal of confidence, even though there's a lot of pressure around that at bat. It gives you a great deal of confidence that you're at least going to put the ball in play um, and get that job done. Now, whether the ball is going to be in play toward an infielder or an outfielder, I'm not going to drive in a run. That's another situation. But I honestly felt like I was going to, get the barrel to the ball. Um, and I was hoping that obviously I would not uh, hit it to somebody who could make the play at home plate. Yeah. Did you, uh, did you know what, uh, what pitch did you think was going to, that Pena was going to throw to you at, at that so moment? So I'm looking, I'm looking fastball for his pitch. Um, I do not want to get two strikes on me because that's when the umpire starts to get involved. He feels the pressure too. being mm. game seven. He's a human being. Is he going to call a strike? That's not a strike with two strikes on me. So I felt it was very important for me to get the first pitch strike and swing the bat. And fortunately for me, Pena threw a perfect hitter's pitch. It was high and away. The outfielder's in. So I just got to hit it over the outfielder's head. And uh, as soon as I got the barrel to the ball, I knew it was going to be far enough over Brian Hunter's head in left field. And I raised my right arm yeah. as I was running toward first base. And uh, I became a... a a name in Minnesota for my whole life because of one stink and swing. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, good for you though. That's, a, that's amazing. I mean, hey, next, if, whenever I'm in Minnesota, I see you in a grocery store. Hey, what's up, Gina? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, <just> exactly. You. <laughs> but uh, I know, um, I, if I'm correct, I believe you were battling knee issues throughout your career. Now, did that have a play in, in that moment? Yeah, I was I was very lucky. Um, we had played Toronto in the ALCS. Yeah. And I had a bad knee, patella tendonitis. Um, and then during the uh, the World Series, it started to flare up again and uh, did not have the ability to run real well. I, went, I wasn't a fast runner to start with, so then with patella tendonitis, it was even slower than normal. So mm-hmm. in that particular situation, if I hit a ground ball, there's a pretty good chance that the Braves are going to be able to turn a double play. So I felt fortunate that Pena threw a pitch high that I can get the ball into the outfield and uh, – so I was, again, in a lot of different ways, I've been a real fortunate player during the twin, my twin era. Mm. Now that was the second, that concluded your second World Series championship season. What were some of the differences between your <clears throat> rookie World Series championship season in 1987 and then obviously the 1991 series you won with Minnesota? Yeah, the team-wise, guys, I think uh, – the 91 team had a deeper starting rotation. The 87 team had uh, essentially two big starters in Frank Viola, which you know from East Meadow, New York, oh, wow, and yeah. uh, Bert Blylevin, a Hall of Famer. Um, and then we had a third guy, Lester Straker, who was a good third pitcher, but he wasn't of the ability of the first two guys. So um, we were a deeper starting staff with the 91 team. Jack Morris obviously played a huge role in the 91 rotation. Um, defensively, very, very similar teams. Um, third baseman in 87 was Gary Gaetti, or his uh, third base in 91 was another New Yorker, Scotty Leas from Amaranek, New York. Um, and he platoon with Mike Pallarulo, an ex-Yankee, as a matter of fact. You guys know Pallarulo from those days. Yeah. Um, so very similar teams. Catching was very similar. So, I mean, I, people always ask me, would the 87 team beat the 91 team? I think the 91 team would beat the 87 team, but in a very close seven-game series, maybe 4-2 four, four, or 4-3. Four, um, but uh, in both, I would say the similarities for both teams are just tremendous competitors. Each guy, I was very fortunate to come 
along where guys got along, tremendous camaraderie, tremendous culture, playing the game the right way. It was about winning the game. It, was, it wasn't about individual stats. Both teams had that impressed upon them by Tom Kelly and the coaching staff. So very, very similar teams, but because of the depth in the 891 pitching rotation, I would say the 91 team would have a slight edge. So uh, I'm curious, you were one of six players to play for both the 87 and 91 teams, Correct. along with Dan Gladden, who we saw score on your single, uh, Randy Bush, Greg Gagne, Kirby Puckett, Al Newman, and Kent Herbeck. Um, what, what's the importance of having a sustainable core year to year and building a championship contender or winner? Listen, I, I think uh, you could win in a lot of different ways. Um, but I think during the late 80s, early 90s in the Minnesota Twins teams, the, the, the main constant was who is our leader. And our leader was Tom Kelly, the manager. He, he impressed upon fundamentals. He impressed upon playing the game the right way, running balls out, not individual statistics. We had some really superstar players in Kirby Puckett and – Frank Vola in 87, Cy Young Award, Burt Blylevin, you know. Greg Gagne was a great shortstop. So we had a lot of great individual players that put up big numbers. But if you'd walk into our clubhouse after a win or a loss, you had the same type of mentality. It's not about going 0 for 4 or 4 for 4. It's about did you have the W or did you have the L next to your team that particular night. And if you had a W, it didn't matter if you went 0 for 4. If you if you lost the game and you went 4 for 4, it didn't make you feel any better. So that type of mentality, when you're brought up as a rookie in 1987, when you see those guys take that attitude, running balls out when you're down by a lot of runs in the ninth inning, you immediately say, this is the way I've got to play the game if I want to stay in this organization. And if you did not do that, you would basically said, OK, you got one more chance not to screw up as far as not bringing that mentality to the field. Are you going to go back down to AAA or we're going to get rid of you and try to get someone in here who believes that's the philosophy that you should adhere to in the twin organization? So you learn that as a rookie from the leadership of the manager and the coaching staff. And you learn that from the veteran Hall of Famers that you played with, that that's the way we're going to play if you don't like it. There's other teams to go out and try to try to play for. You end up in AAA or AA again, and you never get back up to the big leagues because that reputation starts to take uh, its own in other organizations. And when they hear that the Twins don't like you, not too many other organizations are going to have you. Mm. Right. And now you, you've mentioned Tom Kelly a couple of times now, who is the manager for those teams. Uh, what was it like playing for him? Um, very easy guy to play for because he'd sit you down and say, this is what we're going to do. This is what your role is going to be. Um, I knew my role. I pretty much knew when I was going to play against certain pitchers. Ken Herbeck was the great first baseman the Twins had. Um, so I knew I was going to be backing him up, playing against certain left-handers. Like I knew Randy Johnson on the mound. I was going to play against Randy Johnson. It wasn't a lot of fun playing <laughs> against Randy Johnson, but I knew I was going to play certain right-handed pitchers I was going to play against because I hit him well. Um, if Kent got hurt, I was the first baseman. I knew I was going to do it. So basically what I'm trying to say is he gave you a really good idea of when you're going to play. Um, there are a lot of managers that if you're a role player, you don't play as frequently. Basically, you just pinch hit. Well, pinch hitting is very, very hard to start with. And if you don't have a start or two in between your pinch hitting opportunities, it's even harder. But what Tom Kelly did with me and other guys who played – in that particular role. He gave us a spot start, maybe two starts a week, so that if he ever needed us to pinch hit in a situation, we weren't stale. We were pretty mm -hmm. loose, ready to go. We had seen live pitching during the week, so we'd have a better chance of uh, doing the job as a pinch hitter role player. So I always found that amazing that he took it upon himself, not only dealing with the top nine players every every day, he kind of dealt with the, the bottom row guys, gave them an opportunity of success. And that, that means the world for a role player, that you feel like you're part of the team every day and in, in and out. Uh, you mentioned Randy Johnson was one of the pitchers um, <laughs> you faced. That was not, uh, not as fun to play. I mean, I definitely, um, I mean, if I'm in, if I'm in back, you know, the backcourt of um, picking and playing edge. I'm sure I, I would pick him and pitch for my team. <laughs> uh, I have to ask, though, uh, what were some of the other tough pitchers you faced um, during your playing career, whether, you know, even if it was in the minors or in the majors? 
Yeah, so if when I'm batting uh, right-handed, obviously Randy Johnson is by far. Nobody's even come close. Um, just dominating fastball, backdoor sliders, uh, made yeah. you look stupid. It's like almost facing a guy that you knew. If you put the ball in play, it was a victory, even though if you didn't get a hit, it was just a victory. And when I was a left-handed hitter, I felt that, uh, you know, Roger Clemens was a, a very difficult guy to hit wow. um, for obvious reasons. Um, tremendous fastball, tremendous competitor. The next pitch is under your chin. He didn't even like to take a good swing off of him. Um, so you knew that when you get in the box, it was going to be a battle. Um, but there's a lot of guys that were good. Um, Mark Ubiza used to pitch for the Kansas City Royals, a nasty slider. Um, he was really tough for me to hit. So there's a few guys that I hit okay, but, uh, you know, 267 career hitter, there's nobody I really lighted it up against. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, going back to both World Series uh, teams, obviously it's tough to repeat in general to be a champion. It's hard to be a champion in general. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, how difficult was it for uh, both the 87 or the 91 teams to have the mindset where you guys had to attempt to repeat as World Series champions knowing that you know, you guys were the squad that was the hunted no, and no longer the hunter. Was well, frankly, was in 1988, we had a really good season. Um, 1987, we had an average season. We only were 500 team, uh, and we very rarely won away from the Metrodome in 87. So we played better in 88 overall the whole season, but we ran into a team of Oakland A's mm. during that time that was a, a, a great team. So Oakland won it in 88. Um, in 1990, we were the worst place team, if you remember. In 1990, the Twins were the worst place team. In 91, we ended up playing another worst team from 1990. It was two teams that had gone from last place mm -hmm. to first place to ending up in the World Series in 91. So um, in 92, we played okay, but we weren't, you know, we weren't as obviously as good as 91. So it is tremendously difficult to win one time. Um, so to win back-to-back -back is even more difficult, and that's why you – you know, getting back to your one of your first questions this morning about the Yankee dynasty winning, how many in a row they, had they win in the, during the Jeter Posada days? And um, so you got to tip your cap to te teams who can not only win it once, but win it, win it consecutively, because that is a tough task. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned how both the Braves and, and, the, twi uh, and the Twins, right? I mean, in 91, right? The Bra you said the Braves were the bottom last two, right? Yeah. Do you feel like, I mean, do you feel like it's easier to re, not easier to rebuild in baseball, but do you feel like it's quicker in a way? Um, I mean, yeah, well, the, obviously I mean, with uh, free agency, if you can, if you have some money to throw out some good players, you could, you could pick your fruit and bring it into your organization. Um, you know, especially from a pitching perspective, you can get two or three, except for the Mets this year, they went out to get two studs and look what happened to them. So yeah. it's not as easy. I mean, there's a way to go about it, trying to right. rebuild quicker, but you need health. You need a little luck. Um, you need your big guys to have good years. Um, winning is very, very hard. That's why you respect teams like the Dodgers or the Braves who continually get to the playoffs. It yeah. seems like every year, those guys are just top of the line and, Got great uh, scouts who draft properly, develop in the minor leagues. Um, for every every great Hall of Fame player you've got on your field, you probably have two or three younger guys who are just learning how to play the game that are having a very good year. Look at the Orioles this year. I mean, after yeah, I was, I was how say. many years have they been one of the laughing stocks of the game and all of a sudden everybody wants to watch them play because all their younger guys are getting very, very good at the same time. Um, mm. So – if you look at that team, that team looks like it's going to be really good for at least five or six more years before they lose their younger players to free agency. So until until those guys who are rookies or second year players become six year players, they look like they're going to go on a nice run here in the American League East. Yeah, yeah much, and it, much to my dismay as a Yankees fan. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they just clinched uh, a spot too. The Orioles too. Yep. Yep. Just this weekend. So I'm I'm curious. You played with a, a bunch of Hall of Famers: Kirby Puckett, Steve Carlton, Burt Blylevin, and Jack Morris. Uh, what was that like? What were some of the, the moments you remember with those guys, or lessons you learned playing alongside them? The thing the thing about playing with guys with so much ability, um, 
I think from the outside looking in, it looks like it comes easy to them, fellas. But I will tell you, at least from a positional perspective, I mean, you talk about Burt and Jack and Carlton. Um, I watched them throw pens in the bullpen. I watched them prepare. Um, it wasn't like they were just throwing their glove on the mound and, and trying to get victories. They were preparing in the weight room, stretching, all the stuff that the average person does not see behind the scenes that they do week in and week out to prepare for their start. And, and from a hitting perspective, um, I played seven years with Kirby Puckett, um, probably one of the best hitters in his generation. He took extra batting practice, no lie, every day. Not once or twice a week, every day. He was in the batting cage before our normal batting practice as a team. Um, and, I, and I used to shag for him. Um, the, the role players would come out early before BP and get enough swings in and prepare um, because that's what we had to do to stay ready. But our best hitter, Kirby Puckett, was out there with us every day taking extra BP. So people would assume that he's just showing up at a, at, for, a five, for a 7 o'clock game at 5 o'clock going through his routine. He's there at 3 o'clock with the role players four hours before a game taking extra BP to prepare for his day. And there's a guy that played 150, 155 games a year that was at the park early every day. And you wonder why he is so good at what he did is because he wanted to be that good. He wanted to be that dominant as our number three hitter. And when you watch that as a role player, say, well, if he can do it, I certainly should have the ability to get there and take as many swings as I can to get better. Mm. Interesting. Um, what was it like playing at the Metro Dome? I always, you know, I was born in 2000, so I didn't watch games at the Metro Dome. But I've sure. seen the highlights and whatnot. It oh, looks yeah. so different than all the other games back then. Very good. Was that? Very good. Very good hitters park. Very tough to play defensively. Um, I know pitchers didn't like it. The turf was fast. Um, defensively, when I played in the outfield, it was very difficult to pick the white ball up against the white roof. Um, so a number of balls were misplayed in the outfield by not only visiting teams, but by us as well, because it's not an easy place to play. But a very good hitters park. Um, you know, it was a it was a stadium built for football that uh, yeah, yep. put up in there in the summertime. So it wasn't a really easy place for fans to watch at the different angles of the seats. But, uh, you know, when they packed it, it was noisy. And we used that as our advantage quite a bit um, in 87 and 91. Mm. The opposing teams that came in with a sold out crowd. Um, you know, there's an old story going around that the uh, the bullpen phone could not be heard because it was so loud. So our pitching coach could not even hear the phone. So we had to run down to the to the uh, pen to let the pitching coach know we need to get our relief pitcher up because he couldn't hear the phone ring. So that's how loud it was. It was almost wow. like a plane taking off right in your ear, um, you know, during that particular time in the World Series. It was incredibly exciting, incredibly noisy um, during those two two series. Yeah. The beauty of playoff baseball, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, we saw I, earlier. Yeah, I gotta ask. I've seen this rumor for years. Is it true that they would turn the AC on when the <laughs> Twins were hitting? Oh, that that is false. That that was something. <laughs> that was something that ba Bobby Valentine, who was coaching the Texas Rangers at the time, mm, yes, um, he kind of felt that we were hitting a lot more home runs in the Metrodome, and he was he had seen some air conditioning. Uh, be turned up for whatever reason in early BP, and he got that notion that, oh, we're going to watch to see if this is turned up when we're hitting and then turned down while he's hitting. It's a, that was false because no one was helping my swing. I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> I wish it was on when I was in the bad, but that certainly wasn't the case. <laughs> now, uh, we obviously, we talk about the Metrodome and how, you know, how cool it was to play, you know, back – Back then, were there any other uh, MLB ballparks you liked to play in back then? Um, it took me about a year to get a hit in Yankee Stadium because I was so uptight and nervous in, in front of playing with my in front of uh, my family and friends. Yeah. Um, but I hit a my longest home run in my career was at, at Yankee Stadium against Rick Roden. And after I got that hit, I kind of relaxed a little bit and I enjoyed playing at Yankee Stadium, even though. 
the bleacher guys were not giving me a round of applause when I was playing right field. Believe me, a lot of f bombs being thrown around at my. <laughs> uh, oh yeah, I can imagine. Don't worry. But I, can... I enjoyed hitting in Seattle, uh, Texas. The toughest part for me to hit in was Oakland because of the uh, extended foul territory. I mean, it was brutal. It was just yeah. terrible. So. And I'm kind of glad that they're leaving Oakland because that place was a dump. <laughs> yeah, it's. Uh, I think it's long overdue and outdated. They finally got out of there. I mean, it was it, a it dump in 1987. I'd hate to see how it is now. <laughs> yeah, see the yeah. stories, sewage oh, in the dugouts. Right? Yeah, that definitely sucks for the Oakland fans, though. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I, mean, I, mean, I wish. I wish the Oakland fans would. I mean, I don't want them to leave Oakland because the Oakland fans deserve better. Um, but when you read what's been going on in that organization and have lack of upkeep for the stadium, it's, uh, it's sad what has transpired. And if you've been Oakland A fan, because they had some tremendous teams yeah. um, in the late 80s, early 90s, obviously, you know, battling them, 88, 89. Um, the fans deserve better. And I, and I hope at the end of the day they, they get better. Yeah. Well, we'll soon, we'll soon find out. Now, after 1990, the 1993 season, um, obviously, you uh, retired from baseball. Um, I didn't retire, Brandon. I got not, cut. Not, let's let's tell it like it is. Uh, like it is. <laughs> so after after you got cut, that led you. Um, well, well, after you got cut, uh, what were the other op- options at that point? Did you um? Was, yeah, there so any I got teams? cut. Yeah. I got cut the last week or two of spring training in '94. I had uh, torn my Achilles in '93. I missed about half the season, maybe more than half the season. I rehabbed it in the off season, going into '94. Um, came back. I was a hundred percent in '93. The team did not have a very good season. Mm-hmm. Um, so in '94, um, I think the front office. This is just me surmising this. I think the front office felt that. Um, it was kind of like a mini rebuild stage and they wanted to go with their younger players to see what they had. Um, so it wasn't a surprise. I had a pretty good spring training in 94. Um, so it wasn't a surprise that I got cut. Uh, and when I got cut, you go home and you kind of re- reevaluate, you get on the phone with your agent and see, you know, talk it through what's available. And then I immediately got some calls from the Indians now the Guardians and uh, the Pirates. And I, I sat back and I said, you know, I think mentally I'm done as a player. Um, being a 24th or 25th guy on each team I played on, it was a mental grind day in and day out trying to stay in the big leagues. It wasn't like I was guaranteed four at bats a game and I could go through a slump. So mentally it, it was really hard um, to, to keep grinding it out and practicing and preparing and, you know, after I got cut, I, I wanted to take a, a deep breath away from the game and said, I appreciate the offer, but I'm going to just take some time away. And, you know, and I did. I basically retired. Um, if you remember, you don't remember, you're too young. But in 94, it was a strike year, too. Um, yeah. And I actually looked into tra- possibly going into Japan, playing in Japan um, that season after I got cut just for just for the money and the cultural experience. Yeah. Um, and then when the 94 season got cut short, a lot of the guys who uh, were going to be playing in the big leagues decided to go to Japan kind of, and they took my spots. So that wasn't an opportunity that I could go after anymore. And, and when that happened, I basically shut it down and said, I'm done playing professionally. I had two young children. Um, mm-hmm. You know, let's watch them grow. I was pretty smart with my money. So it wasn't, I had to go out and play again right away. So um, I just, you know, called off the dog, so to speak. And yeah. uh, retired, and uh, it's been a long, long retirement from the way from the game. But uh, it was something I felt was necessary and right for me, and uh, I have no regrets doing that at all. Mm. Now, you mentioned the uh, grinds being, you know, the twenty fourth or twenty fifth guy on a roster. I saw in your two postseason runs, you only played in thirteen games and only had twelve plate appearances. How did you stay ready coming off the bench? you know, ready at a moment's notice and whatnot, staying locked in, focused and prepared. In yeah, those runs. I, I go back to, you know, you know your role, you know why you're on the team. Um, so for mm-hmm. me, it was evaluating and watching every relief pitcher that came in, whether it was a lefty or righty, um, finding out what their strengths and weaknesses are, what's their out pitch, what do they like to throw with two strikes when they need a strikeout. 
Um, and then also knowing when you might be called upon to pinch hit. Like, who would you be pinch hitting for in our Minnesota Twins lineup? Um, that might be one or two guys that you had done that during the regular season. So when their time in the order is coming up, you know, you get amped up a little bit more um, mentally. Is that, okay, this particular guy might be pinched hit for, might be called upon, who might be coming in. So mentally you kind of go through this uh, workout to see who you might pinch hit for and what the strengths and weaknesses are. And physically, you know, you go up in the clubhouse, you ride the stationary bike, you swing a weighted bat, you, you know, you might be taking some soft toss or tee work just to get some lather going. Um, so you do all that type of stuff to uh, prepare yourself for the particular at bat that might come about. Interesting. Yeah. You now, uh, obviously, um, you talked about the minor, how you, you know you rose up in the minor league system pretty quick with the Twins. Now, in your opinion, do you feel like there are what any players that come to mind you feel like were deserving of a call? Because in the minors, you could stay there for years. Yeah, so the funny thing is, though, your first spring training out, outside of you, you're graduate from Columbia, and then you go, you play your first spring training as a minor leaguer, and you meet guys that have, you've never met before. Some are high school players that were drafted, some are college players, some are Division One guys from the SEC, ACC that um, were drafted much higher than you. Um, the number one pick in 1984 was a gentleman named Jay Bell. Um, and you will not remember Jay Bell, but he was the shortstop for the Pittsburgh Pirates um, when the Barry Bonds, Bar Bobby Bonilla era, Andy Van Slake, yeah. when they were really good and they were playing the Braves in the playoffs. And Jay and I became very good friends because we roomed together in the minor leagues. Um, and after our first year in the minor leagues, he got traded to Cleveland for Burt Blylevin. And Burt Blylevin came to yeah. pitch for the Twins, and that's how we got Burt again for the second time. So um, I, I tell young players – almost weekly that you're going to run into people who are tremendous athletes who are much better athletic bodies and minds than you. But the one thing that you can go and compete against them is having a mental strength to you that you treat failure like it is something you learn from. You don't sit and pout and go, when you go through slumps, because there's a lot of guys in the minor leagues, fellas, that I thought were destined to play professionally with the twins that didn't have the mental strength, um, who had never um, seen failure before as a great high school player, as a great college player, and they could not handle failure. And right. failure is such a big part of baseball that if you can't handle failure, you're probably not going to reach the pinnacle of your profession because there's just so much of it. And mentally, it just starts to wear on you. And when you get worn out mentally, it starts to affect you physically too. Your bat speed, your, your fundamentals, you know, right. don't – digress so um there's a lot of stuff that uh as an average player that i felt that i had to be up on my game with is being mentally strong and dealing with failure and i felt i did a pretty good job in the minor leagues and i think the twins recognized that and they gave me an opportunity in 87 to be called up okay interesting um you've mentioned jay bell um who you're close with when you're in the minors, do you still keep in touch or are friends with any of your teammates from back in the day? Sure. We've got about five or six guys that live here in the twin cities that we, in fact, we go down to uh, Fort Myers every January for what they call twins fantasy camp. Okay. And there's probably about 19, 20 guys that go down every year. Um, and for a week we, we shoot the bull. We reminisce. We tell the same stories. We're better players than we really were 20, 30 years you know, all that good stuff, um, mm. have a few pops. And, uh, you know, we meet and greet and have some fun with uh, some people who come down to participate in Twins Fantasy Camp. Uh, we kind of put them through like a, a week-long spring training where they prepare in the morning and they'll play a doubleheader in the afternoon. And um, so it's a lot of fun. But I've been doing that since 1995, too. So I'm like I'm an old man. I used to be the, the youngest former player there. Now I'm probably one of the most older guys there, too. So it's kind of fun. But it keeps us – um, involved with each other. You know, we talk about how the families are doing all that good stuff. But like I said, there's about four or five guys still living in the Twin Cities. We'll play some golf in the summertime yeah. together and, and uh, get together in, in that regard. Okay. Do you still follow baseball? Like, do you still watch the Twins? Or you said you grew up a Yankees fan, the Yankees? Yeah, I followed a little bit. But, uh, you know, I'm one of those dinosaurs that there's, there's just too much <laughs> swinging and missing these days. 
Um, you know, I'm all for analytics. I think analytics is a positive for the game, but I also think analytics has gotten to the point where it's too extreme mm. and it kind of takes so in my opinion, anyway, it takes away from the athleticism of the game. And what do I mean by this is that I think that this year was, has been enhanced so much by limiting the, uh, the movement of the infielders where you can't have a right, yeah. uh, second right fielder, the shifts, you know, limiting the shifts. And the pitch count has definitely enhanced the game. I, I think that, to me, it was getting three-and-a-half-hour games. It was ridiculous. Yeah. Um, so the pitch the pitch clock and the lack of shifting or the limiting shifting has really – like, I don't want my third baseman playing short because the reason why he's not playing short because he's the third baseman, if you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. um, he doesn't have the range. That's why he's playing third. But now you're making him play short. So um, I didn't ever like that. And I think the limiting of it is really – enhance the game um but I'll, I'll watch the playoffs in the world series full but during the season i'll watch a limited amount of games i'll go to a handful of twins games but i'm not a a guy that's going to go to four or five games a week when they're home right hey man your twins might be winning the division if they not- got a shot they got a yeah. shot this year you know i think uh they've got a good pitching staff they got a good young nucleus on offense um but They've had such down playoff runs. They have not won a playoff game in years. They, they've had tremendous, tremendous bad luck mm-hmm. against the Yankees. They can't beat the Yankees. So the fact that the Yankees aren't involved this year, they've got a good chance. Yeah. They've got the advantage in the first round. They're going to play the last wild card team, and they've got all three games at target field. So that's a big, big positive. So I'm looking for them to get out of the first round and then see who play the second round. Mm. Um, any players in today that you uh, like that? Um... Oh, I'm a I'm a big Freddie Freeman guy. Yeah, Freddie I'm Freeman. I'm a big Mike Trout guy. Um, right. Guys that uh, play the game the right way. There's, uh, you know, again, I'm an old man. So guys that just play the game right way, they mm-hmm. don't got to salute themselves every time they hit the ball hard or hit a home run. Freddie Freeman, to me, is the ultimate professional hitter. Whether you throw a lefty against him or a righty, he's going to hit the ball hard. He plays great defense. He's a great team leader. Yeah. Um, so he's the kind of guy from the left side that uh, I, I really appreciate um, immensely. Yeah, he's he's uh, Freddie Freeman's definitely a great great leader, and he shows on the field too with the level of his play. Yep. You know, so, um, what do you think of the the Shohei uh, situation? Whether with uh, I know he just got shut down. And yeah. Played out of know, with the Angels. Again. Knowing how difficult it is to do those two skills at that level, um, and he makes it look easy. I know he probably works his butt off to do that, but he makes it look easy, doesn't he? Um, guys throwing that hard, striking that many guys out, hitting 40 home runs, um, runs the bases well. It's unfortunate. It would have been kind of interesting to find out from a, from a free agency perspective how much money he would make. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming the injuries are going to curtail the number. Maybe not. I'm not sure. Yeah. But if he's not going to be able to pitch next year because of the surgery, um, you know, he becomes one-dimensional like everybody else is. He's a hitter. Um, so um, we'll see who, out, who goes and gets him. It, I, I'm more interested in whether Mike Trout stays now that Otani's yeah. probably not going to come back. And does the, the Angels go completely rebuild and, you know, gets rid of two of the best players in the game at the same time and start over again. Cause if you're the uh, general manager, you have to think about that because it's pretty much guaranteed Otani has gone. And uh, if Otani has gone, Trout's going to feel like they probably can't make a playoff run next year. Um, so is it in his best interest to try to play for a team that has a potential playoff run next year? So it'll be interesting if they lose their two, two stalwarts, in yeah. the same same year. Yeah, it certainly will be interesting to see. Earlier, I had asked you about um, playing alongside the Hall of Famers, Burt Blylevin, Steve Carlton, Jack Morris, and Kirby Puckett. Do you think any of the other players you played with or against at the big league level were deserving of a spot in Cooperstown but didn't get the call? Um, well, now that Burt got in, I think it's hard. I... I I think every it to me Hall of Fame is not only being a a very good player; it's it's being a once in an era player. Um, So I think 
it's hard for me to say this particular guy deserves Hall of Fame, even though he was a very, very good player in, in certain years, great player. I think, you know, from the Twins' perspective, and I never played with them, but it'll be interesting to see how the voters regard Joe Maurer. Um, mm -hmm. Because from a catching perspective, early part of his career, he was on, he was destined to be a Hall of Fame catcher. Mm -hmm. There was nobody better during his era batting titles, yep. tremendous defense. Um, but then he got concussed and then had to leave catching and become a first baseman. He's still a very good hitter as a first baseman, but when you compare numbers as first baseman on the power side, his numbers don't help power-wise. So because he's not a catcher for 10, 12, 15 years putting up exceptional numbers, people are going to have to evaluate whether his overall career was a Hall of Fame career because his first five to six years as a catcher, a Hall of Fame material. But is, does that warrant uh, a Hall of Fame um, after his concussion? I, I say he does. I, I say he does. So I hope they take that into consideration where an injury curtailed a Hall of Fame catching career, but his overall, I don't know how many years he played, 10 or 12 still warrant Hall of Fame material, in my opinion. And besides the fact that he's such a great guy and a gentleman and terrific for the fans of Minnesota, I, I like to see good people rewarded for great careers. I really do. And I think yeah. Joe um, should have that. Yeah. Um, your era, that late 80s to 90s, is, is kind of regarded by some as being the steroid era. Do you think some of the guys you played against during that time – were unfairly ostracized for their actions in that? Or do you think that they're not getting in the Hall of Fame and it's deserving because they cheated? So that's an interesting question. So, you know, if you're going to go back to that era, it was pretty obvious that guys were getting very large in a short period of time. Um, and it wasn't just because you're in the weight room every day, because I was in the weight room every day <laughs> and I wasn't getting that large. So uh, as players, you knew what was going on. Now, in my opinion, there are a lot of guys from a lot of different teams that were doing it. Mm. Um, just because we, you know, when you see one guy in, in a year and then the following year, you see him and say, you know, there's got to be something different here. We're not just taking yeah. pure protein shakes. That type of deal. You know what I mean? Yeah, no weight gainers, so, no. It's, it's hard. Um I am I'm just baffled by the people who are not in the Hall of Fame because of steroids. They really didn't need to be enhanced. They were such tremendous players. They yeah. were gonna be Hall of Famers anyway. I don't understand why you put that stuff in your body when you're yeah. you're the best player on your team. You're the best player in your era. So why do you think you have to get better? I don't understand yeah. that mentality. And maybe it's an ego thing, maybe it's a fear thing. I don't know what was transpiring as they were going through that process. But that, to me, is the saddest part. It wasn't like guys like me who were below average big leaguers who were getting tremendously, you know, enhanced by it. It was guys that were really good to start with. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't understand that mentality because they did not need that stuff to be a top 10 player in the major leagues during their era. They just didn't, in my opinion. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. Now, uh, you own a facility in Adena, Minnesota called Nevers Larkin Baseball, and you co-own it with former twin Tom Nevers. So tell us how you, you two met and how this tra training facility came about. So Tommy and I, I'm, I'm 10 years older than Tommy. And Tommy was a uh, minor league player. He was drafted number one by the Houston Astros um, right out of high school. Wow. Okay. And uh, he played a number of years. In the minors, um, he just didn't get an opportunity to play in the big leagues for a certain reason. We don't know. He doesn't know. He just, you know, he just felt a little shy. Yeah. So he played AAA a number of years, AA, put good numbers up, but uh, unfortunately did not have the luck involved by getting called up. So, um, you know, he had a, a facility and I was just, you know, looking for a place to train with my son at the time. And I went in there. We had a conversation uh, did a little instruction with him, my son, a little instruction for the other kids. And I, I kind of found that I enjoyed it more than I thought I would. And I just approached Tom about, uh, you know, being partners with him 
and now we've been partners for 16 years and it's been a good run. So wow. um, we, we run club teams, we do instruction, we have winter programs, you know, like all the other club teams do. So it's been a, it's been a good run. I enjoy it. And it's been good for me to stay young, being around young people. That's, that's awesome. amazing. Yeah. That's Give amazing. Back to the game you love. Yeah. yeah. And um, I guess one last question. Um, Back in the Sam Rayfield's days, um, <laughs> hanging out with, uh, with Matt Doherty and obviously my father, Sal, who, who made, made the cameo in the beginning of these things here. Uh, he told me about a, a game called Saki. Now, yes. can, you, what, can you explain that? The Saki is a combination of hockey and soccer. That we ah, just okay. Took the right. ball around and uh, kind of had two goals. And we couldn't, you know, we look forward to every kid in elementary school looks forward to recess. So we just made up this game, Saki. And, uh, you know, got a little rough at times. Matt kicked my butt one time. He doesn't remember that. We, we had a conversation about this last <laughs> year. He doesn't remember kicking my butt in Saki. But uh, he, was like the, he was like the enforcer. You know, he was the big mm. guy, big basketball stud. And yep. I was a little baseball player trying to kick the ball around. And uh, so he kind of dominated Saki as well as he did basketball. So we had some good athletes coming out of St. Rayfields during that era, too. So it was yeah. kind of fun. Yeah. Now, um, I know you said you lived in New York and now you're in Minnesota. Um, is there a difference in, in the, um, in the States? Obviously, like I know, I know you mentioned difference. Me, I still Everything's got the different accent. about New York. <laughs> well, I mean, obviously there's a lot of differences, but I mean, um, I mean, I know my act, I know you said you noticed my I accent love, right I away. I know. Most of my accent. I have a little bit like when I go back home to visit my family, I've got a brother who lives in Huntington and we go, you know, I'll go back there once or twice a year. Yeah. Um, I'll pick up a little accent. And when I come back to Minnesota, the people say, oh, you must have went back to New York. You got that accent. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> I heard you say noisy. The way you I said noisy, I'm like, you still got that I New York accent there, dude. I drop more F-bombs when I'm in New York than I do. <laughs> <laughs> well, how, how, could you, how could you not? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> too many too many people running into you with the shoulders in New York when you're walking through Manhattan. So oh, it's man. unbelievable, you know? Oh, so, yeah. Was there... New York was a great place to, to uh, grow up. I'm glad I live in the Midwest, though. It's a lot less populated. <laughs> okay, yeah. All right. <laughs> all, right. Um, all right. I guess uh, yeah. next time. Well, next time I'm in Minnesota, I'll definitely. Uh, yeah. 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 Or like I said, next don't time. Come out, don't come out in the winter, though. It's too freaking cold. <laughs> Unless I'm yeah. in the Metrodome or <laughs> the, uh, the new Viking Stadium, they say. You know? U.S. Bank, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But yes, obviously. Um, thank you again, Gene. We thank you again for joining us for uh, Dennis, Brandon. It was it was a lot of fun. I appreciate it. you guys are good at what you do and tremendous success going forward with your show. I really appreciate you having me on this morning. Thank, thank you, yes, thank, thank you, Gene, you. for sitting down talk, talking with us. Much appreciated. Obviously, thank you. Yeah, next time you're in New York, you know, I'll we'll look see. you guys up. Yeah, like I said, thank you again, and um, have a great rest of your day, and have a great rest of your week. You too. Take care, guys. Take Pleasure care. All right, that is it for um, our 50th episode of Primetime Rundown, the interview series. Really, obviously, really appreciate Gene coming on. Now, be sure to check, uh, be sure to join myself, Dennis, on another edition of Bad and Chad every Wednesday night on our YouTube channel. Now, be sure to subscribe by searching Eastern Observer on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. For Dennis and Gene, I'm Brandon Natale. And for us at the Blackjack Media Group and Primetime Rundown interview series, we, we will see you next time.